So our next speaker is Judith Katzenellen Bogan. And Judith has a very impressive bio which is in your um, speaker material. Judith has worked in South Africa, New Zealand and Australia on a wide variety of health conditions. And she's going to be talking to us today about Aboriginal chronic disease and particularly ischemic heart disease. There's a couple of things you probably don't know about Judith. Um, if we think about her surname, Cats and Ellenbogen, that means Cat's Elbow and may originate from the name of a castle and a small town in the district in Rhineland in Germany. And importantly, one of Judith's favourite quotes is to every problem there is a solution. So we're looking forward to some of them. Thanks, Judith. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and pay my respects to elders past and present, in particular the Ngunnawal Nambri people here in Canberra. Um, so why decide to talk about cardiovascular disease here in a session on closing the gap? And this slide here from the um, most recent uh, Australian Burden of Disease study shows that um, the, the, the percentage contribution of leading disease groups to the gap between um, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal uh, Australians, cardiovascular disease is the single, single biggest contributor at 19%, and if you consider the fatal burden, it's 27%. So if we make a difference on cardiovascular disease, we can really make a difference on the life expectancy. So I think it's an appropriate topic for the session. And then thinking about closing the gap, how might one do that? Um, you can con contemplate it, you can measure it, you can piece by piece put, uh, uh, put the pieces together so that we can bridge that gap. Um, we can engage um, and engage people and, and, and try and make the effort communally. And most importantly, leadership, vision and energy is what we'll need. And so I'll be talking today about three translational projects, in particular the Bettering Aboriginal Heart Health in WA project called BAWA, but I will touch on two other projects as well as a little bit about data linkage in the context of closing the gap. So BAWA was started in 2008 under the leadership of Sandy Thompson, who's here today, and I came in as a postdoc um, at that point. Um, it was built around a strong cardiovascular disease network in WA, with a focus on disparities in cardiovascular health and medical care in Aboriginal people. Um, we did a statewide research, um, but a series of detailed studies, different conditions, different angles, and with an emphasis on the health system and always a commitment to research translation. Um, our methodology was mixed. We uh, had a lot of linked data where we linked hospital and death records, but we also did chart reviews and uh, some qualitative interviews. Um, our perspective has always been that there's obviously a heart disease story starting from the upstream determinants through to the downstream issues. Um, although our research focused on the more downstream ones, it was always around information to support action and change. I'll be talking about four or five key result areas just to give you a taste of some of the results. Um, and as I said, we, um, um, we looked at acute myocardial infarction, heart failure, stroke, and atrial fibrillation. And in all of those, Aboriginal people uh, are characterized by having higher rates, earlier onset, and multi-morbidity. And this slide is just the uh, sort of quintessential slide representative of what we see in that Ab Aboriginal rates, and this, is, in this particular case was incident rates, um, was higher in every age. Um, for males and females, and the incident rate ratios in yellow here was very high at young ages, reducing with age, but even at the oldest age, still having a substantial absolute gap and difference. Um, in terms of multimorbidity, this is from our atrial fibrillation cohort that we in, uh, investigated through linked data. Um, um, we, we conventionally uh, present data now in two broad age groups because to do it in a single age group um, doesn't make sense in two populations with such different um, age structures. But we see here in both broad age groups, Aboriginal uh, uh, people had higher um, uh, comorbidities of all sorts. Uh, you can see diabetes very high as well, um, even, even under 54. 
the next key result area, which I think touches on a lot of what was said yesterday and today, um, is we looked at the complex patient and service factors that cause delay in getting prompt treatment. Um, and the uh, patient factors, and this was from a, um, some interviews in the Kimberley and the Pilbara that we did in 2009, um, and looking at patient factors, the, the multi-comorbidities really um, in, often mean that people have poor symptom recognition and there's a normalization of health in the community. Um, there was a lot of avoidance, which Tom referred to, with fear of implications of, of being diagnosed, so avoiding going in. Uh, often depression linked with fatalism and stoicism. People lead hard lives and, and um, health is a low priority. Likewise, gender roles um, and looking after the family and, and being the provider and being strong um, was more important, um, well, just meant that their own health wasn't prioritised. And again, prioritisation of cultural responsibilities. On the, on the service side, there was clinical complexity, often making it difficult for um, doctors and nurses to diagnose, and, and then unreliable access to urban cardiology services um, for advice and consultation. I think things have changed a bit with um, telemedicine now. Limited and or inappropriate treatment protocols was an issue, and often prob problematic flow of information of patients from between community to community, from hospital to community, and urban to rural. And also the um, cultural misunderstandings we've spoken about so much and limited cultural training for clinicians. The next um, key result I want to talk about is discharges against medical advice, uh, which we use as an indicator of the quality of care of indigenous people. And here we used our ischemic heart disease incident cohort, the first time they came to hospital for ischemic heart disease, and we found that Aboriginal people were eight times more likely to discharge themselves compared with um, non-Indigenous people, and even after adjustment for multiple uh, factors like age, sex, alcohol, and so on, it was still double. Um, another important result here is on um, um, comparing people who lived in rural areas going to rural hospitals. They were three times uh, more likely to Dharma compared with metro patients going to metro hospitals. So there's something about the combination of rural hospital, rural residents that is um, a risk for Dharma, and even after adjustment, quite significant as well. Unsurprisingly then, then health outcomes were significantly worse even after adjustment, and this is a slide um, of the uh, risk-adjusted one-year mortality after first ever heart failure admission. And we can see, particularly in the younger age, twice as likely to have a one-year a mortal death, um, and in the older age group, um, there was no difference between the two groups. System barriers, we've spoken about that a lot, inadequate systems to address the logistical and clinical complexity, cultural safety, a big issue, urban-centric systems of care, and multiple other issues, including short-term funding and so on. So, I've given you a whole diatribe of negativity and, again, falling into that deficit model of Indigenous health that I think we need to move out of. So, um, what is that? We can see that all this disparity research can really reinforce the deficit, that it can overlook the strengths of the services, of um, patients, of communities, and it can overwhelm us all, researchers, clinicians, patients, communities with negativity. And this is just a slide. Um, from one of our studies, you're always hearing about stats, uh, death happens so often. Aboriginal people experience death all the time. Um, we don't have to be ramming the negative things all the time. So we need to be cautious when we use, we need this evidence of disparity, we do, but how to use it, we just have to make sure that it's not a, dis, a, dis, a disempowering health message. So. When we came to deciding what we do with our results, besides publish it in papers, um, we had a decision to disseminate very broadly and to make that solutions focused. We decided to produce an easy read stakeholder report, um, uh, which we would collaboratively develop with a whole range of people and, and focus as our target policy makers and practitioners. Um, we had a very broad partnership on this, and there's all kinds of organizations, I won't go through them. Um, 
But we, uh, we, we uh, uh, did a consultation for solutions through what we called Information for Action workshops. We had representatives from all these diverse uh, sectors where we shared ideas, knowledge and experiences and we got uh, some support for a stakeholder reference group to help guide our report both in terms of content as well as style. And this is the report that was published in 2015. We call, it was a stakeholder easy read report. Uh, we had two sections to it. Part one was all the results of our 30 odd studies that we'd done over the period. Um, in an easy read format, which was sort of vetoed by our stakeholder group to, to, to tell us what was easy to read and not. And more importantly was really part two, which was around strategies to improve Aboriginal heart health. And here we um, looked at actions at different levels, uh, at individual family community level, then at organizational level and policy level. We used case studies and good news stories, and we had some resources there to help translate some of our recommendations into practice. Um, also important was our sort of articulation of what we see as the pyramid of Aboriginal heart disease. Um, at the base of that pyramid are the social determinants, which we all know about, colonisation, poverty, lack of education and so on. These in turn leading to the environment, uh, to the lifestyle uh, factors and lifestyles that people read full of stress, poor diet, lack of exercise and so on. These in turn lead to the precursors of uh, heart disease diabetes, high cholesterol, and so on, and ultimately causing heart disease. And we can see here um, that bottom rung of, of, of the pyramid is common to many diseases, and so every disease has its pathway, but that common social determinants is so powerful. And for every level of that pyramid, we, we then also developed building blocks of solutions. Um, and again, social policy, social policy and system change probably being able to make the, the most difference at that base level, but then healthy lifestyle promotion, early diagnosis and treatment with good primary care, and then good specialist care at the top level. And there's no single level that one does on its own, it's really them all, although we all would agree that if we sorted out that base level, we'd probably, it would make a huge difference. Um, we had a lot of media around this report. Uh, some of it was in the, in the radio news, um, um, some of the popular um, um, medical magazines and so on, as well as the, the, the written media. And um, we, we haven't had an ongoing legacy of the project. Um, at the moment, we're, uh, we've got some updated linked data, which we're um, currently actually looking at uh, um, analyzing the trends to see if there's been an impact of closing the gap, and we're going to be trying to do that in sort of very sort of uh, ecological sort of way. Um, we're also contributing to uh, some other national analyses, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, also, we have an ongoing contribution to the cardiovascular networks in WA, uh, we've held uh, workshop, workshop, ed, um, workforce education workshops, for example, in the Pilbara, where we did a multidisciplinary heart health workshop for doctors, allied health nurses, and ab Aboriginal health workers. And we've also uh, left, um, um, have produced some resources, and this is an example of an educational videos that we produced after our workshop. That's online at the WACRA website. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge a very broad team that was involved with this project and, um, and a lot of them are still involved, some of them not so involved, but the project lives on. Now just moving briefly to another initiative around rheumatic heart disease. Um, just a little bit about rheumatic heart disease for those who don't know. It, um, it starts with a strep infection of the skin or throat and in those people who don't get antibiotic treatment a small percentage develop an autoimmune reaction called acute rheumatic fever. Um, um, ARF affects lots of parts of the body, um, but most importantly, it affects the heart valves. And um, whereas sometimes um, there's no long-term effect uh, of, of, of the heart valves, some people have permanent damage to the heart valves, and that's when it's called rheumatic heart disease. Um, on, uh, once you've had acute rheumatic fever once, you've got a propensity to get it again, and every time there's a recurrence, the heart valve get, gets worse. And so we really, um, yeah, so rheumatic heart disease can be mild, moderate, severe, and, and the very severe ones uh, end up in heart failure and often premature death. Importantly here is that this is actually a, ch a children's, it starts 
in childhood. So acute rheumatic fever peaks between 5 and 14 years old um, and um, sort of premature death is often in the, in, in the 30s. So it's a, it's a disease of young people that is almost completely preventable. And um, in order to prevent it, obviously, at the primordial level, it's about the social determinants, uh, house changing uh, improved housing and, 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 and um, social socioeconomic conditions. Um, at the primary uh, prevention level, it's treating those strep throats so that people don't get the immune reaction. Um, at the secondary level, once you've had acute rheumatic fever, you need um, monthly injections, um, antibiotic injections for 10 years huge ask, and then of course tertiary prevention for the, um, once there's heart failure with rheumatic heart disease, so surgery and so on. So lots of steps, complex pathway. And the end rheumatic heart disease uh, CRE has been formed now. Um, I didn't mention that this is very high in Aboriginal people in Australia. There are some communities that have the highest, one, some of the highest rates in the world. So it's become an, a sort of a, a point of um, saying this is one condition we can really do something about, particularly in the young, and the CRE aims to produce a roadmap of what it will take to close that gap, similar to what you spoke about yesterday, but for RHD and probably a, a disease where the, the intervention is not as simple as you made it out for eye disease yesterday. The CRE hopes to come up with an end game report and strategy um, at the end of 2020, um, which it'll produce, which it'll, it'll give to government um, to try and lay out exactly a stepwise approach to what it'll take to close that gap. In the meanwhile, in that report, there'll be a synthesis of all the science that has gone on. There's obviously a lot of work going on to vaccines through to in, 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 uh, uh, community engagement about the lived experience. And also important in that research is the baseline burden. What is the burden of rheumatic heart disease truly in Australia? We know a lot in the Northern Territory. We don't know that much about the rest of the country. And, and we need that baseline burden to, burden to monitor it into the future. And that's then brings me to the project that I'm leading, which is to look at the, the, the epidemiology of rheumatic heart disease. Um, and we've got, we've recently been funded for this, um, and we have two components to that. The one is a, um, a linked data analysis to determine the burden, uh, the incidence, the prevalence, prevalence and survival. We'll also look at outcomes, because with linked data, you can look forward in time as well, follow people up. And also um, health systems research component, looking at various facilitators and barriers to implementing the known strategies we know that are good. And all this will be feeding into the CRE's strategy report and, um, and into, in, in, into the uh, re um, recommendations to government. It's a very broad collaboration around the country, five jurisdictions we're going to be covering in terms of the linked data. That's where the, the, uh, the um, uh, registers are. And Besides the research network, there's also a End Rheumatic Heart Disease Coalition, which is a broad-based national alliance of health and community organisations. They will be, we will be advocating for a commitment from government to prioritise the end of RHD in Australia. Um, these are the various organisations that are foundation members, um, and they'll be working with the communities both at risk, trying to secure funding and, and political will, and educating and empowering Australians about the role that we can all play in ending RHD. So if people are interested, either as organisations or individuals, to sign on to the coalition. The last project I just want to talk about, which is also um, a, a relatively new initiative, is the Healing Right Way trial. So this is, a, um, it is being done in a clinical setting, but it's a health system intervention uh, um, for Aboriginal people with acquired brain injury. Um, it'll be aiming to enhance the rehabilitation services for these patients. It's being led out of Edith Cowan University, and Sandy and I are both involved with the study. Um, the rationale for this comes from the Missing Voices project that we did in WA, uh, where there were qualitative interviews with um, staff and patients and their families about their needs and their experiences of um, of, of acquired brain injury. Generally, people wanted more rehab, but they found that the complex pathways were difficult to navigate. There seemed to be a disconnect between uh, patients and non-Indigenous staff. 
the health professionals felt underconfident. They um, wanted more culturally appropriate resources and training. And there was a generic acknowledgement of the need for more Aboriginal liaison officers and interpreters. And a similar study found similar in, in the Northern Territory in South Australia found a similar message. So there's a strong rationale for, 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 for a, a improved rehab services. Um, um, the Healing Rightway trial is a partnership project, so we are aiming to improve the quality of life um, for these patients uh, through a delivery of culturally appropriate rehab services to, 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 to this population group. We'll be producing an economic model to support the business case for increased funding and a process evaluation as well. The actual interventions are actually twofold. The first one is the training and employment of an Aboriginal injury coordinator. Um, so each hospital will have one of these. Well, it won't be hospital-based. It's actually an in-reach service to support acute and post-discharge care. And the second component is cultural security training for hospital staff tailored to the service delivery of Aboriginal people with brain injury. And this is not just a generic um, um, cultural security training. It actually has fairly clinical targeted uh, components like communication skills, the local treatment protocols, um, Aboriginal con constructs around um, brain injury and what they are, some cultural appro culturally appropriate assessment tools and therapy tools, and personal stories videos that, that, that we have from, um, from the previous study. So the, the, the trial design is the step which design um, There'll be four metro and four regional hospitals all receiving the intervention in a sequential fashion. Um, and in parallel, there'll be a process evaluation nested in the trial. Now, a, tr a process evaluation is required for complex interventions, and this is a complex intervention in a complex context. So we definitely need one of these, and we hope to be investigating how we implement the study so that it can inform and tweak some of our, our, our implementation, but more importantly also to interpret our results at the end. It's also a big team, and more importantly, the project partners um, are very strong there, the, the government health uh, services, the, N the NGOs, as well as the Aboriginal medical sector. The last point I just want to make is a little bit about data linkage. I've obviously done a lot of that in the past. Um, it's really, we, we need good quality national linked data, and I think in the past, in this forum, there's been people talking about all the data sets in Canberra and AHW have. Well, it's time that we get access to this fantastic national linked data. It's very, it's very useful for um, Aboriginal and rural and remote health monitoring, and uh, because of the small, it, it allows us to study small and dispersed populations and get sufficient events to really get some more detailed studies get some power there. Um, it's also would be very useful for monitoring progress towards goals like closing the gap at a person basis and sort of a person based analysis. At the moment there's prohibitive de delays in getting this data, but we do have some multi-jurisdictional studies underway which I'd like to share with you. Um, I'm involved with three of these. Uh, the one is the rheumatic heart disease one which I've spoken about, the acute coronary syndrome one where we're building on some of the BAWA work and uh, we're going to be doing that in three states and a stroke uh, linked data study in, in, in four states. Um, and the idea is for us to develop the disease specific linked data methods to get a good handle on what the issues are but also the methods because we want to use those methods and advise the AHW when one day they do have linked data available and monitoring so that we maybe don't have those reports where we only have hospital admissions and deaths but we actually have person-based analyses and we we then be able to get that data without long delays and it'll be available for high-level policy. So in conclusion, um, there's a, a range of cardiovascular research supporting the Closing the Gap agenda going on at the moment. Um, the evidence base is built over many years now, and there's continuing evidence being gathered. There's increased collaboration across, across the states in Aboriginal health and cardiovascular disease. Um, increased utilization of linked data as a resource as well as obviously on the ground evaluations at, at, at community level as well. Um, primary prevention is obviously the major challenge, um, but there's a lot we can do uh, to improve secondary prevention as well, discharge care, cardiac and stroke rehab, and case management. And also, um, 
we need to be trialling more innovative ways of improving services and systems for Aboriginal patients, as people have been talking about in all the other sessions as well. So hopefully we're not just producing lots of evidence and reports with little commitment. We, we need to invert that, make sure that there's lots of commitment, that we have vision and leadership, that we have courage and energy. We do things systematically, piece by piece. We measure. We don't just contemplate, but we measure and monitor, and we engage and we um, collaborate on that as communities, as researchers and, uh, cl and clinicians. So I'd just like to acknowledge uh, all my collaborators that I've shown you in the other slides, also the funders of various grants and fellowships that have supported us in this. Thank you very much.